So, one fine day, I'm looking at the Horizon Report, and I'm looking at the broad array of technologies that have been found to be meaningful over the span of the development of the Horizon Report. And when you do that, you get something that looks like this. It's all there. Everything is there on that chart. So how do you make sense of it? How do you go about taking the information that's here and say, let's break it out into a form that we can use, into a form that can tell us how to think about the technologies we use now and the technologies we may be using, may be developing, may be deploying in the future? Well, just looking at a table of information, I can say, well, you know, I can tell that you know, uh, say some items like gesture-based computing have shown up in recent years. I can tell that topics related to gaming have appeared and uh, taken on different forms throughout the history of the report. But it looks like you might want to take a step back. It looks like you might want to take a step back and think, are there factors of commonality here? Are there elements I can draw upon to give me a better way? of looking at this. So it's not just an accumulation of different names. Now, one way of doing this, if you look at the Horizon Report, is to look at the internal commonalities, the internal points of the technologies that relate them to each other. And then, in fact, you can gather them into different categories. And that works very well, and you get some useful information out of this. But those of you who know me know that I like to take the long view, slightly long. OK, a few centuries. Oh, what the heck, a few millennia? More than a few millennia? And I started thinking about, OK, so what happens with the Horizon Report if you look at it through this lens? What happens if you start going back and you start looking at the Horizon Report in terms of the technologies, the developments, the uses of technologies as a result of developments that have made us human, that have made us who we are right now? So you go a bit back, okay, 200,000 years, so right, they could have gone a little bit further back, but we get the first development that shines some light on what's going on here. And that's the development of true sociality when we become what we are today, human. What you see here on this slide is the fossil remains of Omo, which was discovered by Leakey in Ethiopia. And Omo is significant because Omo is the first fully human skeleton that we find. Omo is us. There are no significant differences between Omo and ourselves. Great. So how does this relate to the social aspect? Well, because it turns out that if you want to know, so why did suddenly, you know, out of all of these different hominids, this particular one becomes so successful, and as I said, became us. If you look at theories and analyses of why this happened, you come upon the work of several different people, and there's a consensus that what you see at this point in time emerging is modern language. And modern language is important. It's important because it allows you to have not just small groups that are connected by simple interactions, but larger groups, larger groups that can communicate more important, more diverse, broader intentions, groups that can communicate more complex intent. You know, a chimpanzee can communicate to, with another chimpanzee and point out an intruder or a tasty piece of fruit, but chimpanzees do not have the complexity of language to communicate social interaction. So you look at the work, say, of Robin Dunbar, for instance, who's worked in this arena, and you say, great, so we've got language, we've got sociality, and now we come to the key point. Because this tells us two things. Number one, technologies that promote the social are going to be particularly important because they interact with this fundamental aspect of ourselves, which is that we are crucially social. The first thing that made us who we are is our sociality, that language that enabled that sociality. And there's a second point, because thus far we could say, oh, great, so we just got our social technologies and we're good, right? Well, there's one more little detail. The additional little detail 
is that that sociality takes a particular form that's very important. And you know what it is? Gossip. You need to be able to gossip. Language enables us to gossip about each other, what we're doing with each other, behind each other's backs, what we might be doing tomorrow, all of this wonderful world of gossip, and aha, because now we start to learn something about how this affects how we use up our technologies, which technologies become successful, and which technologies might disappear. Because we want, if we all be social through our technologies, if we all be social in our technologies for learning, we need to be able to gossip in them. We need to be able to be chatty. And if we can't, if we structure things too much because we say, well, we're going to have these blogs and these fora for the course, but don't use them for any type of personal communication. It's just for business and education. You know what happens? You just went against the grain of what makes for sociality in human beings. If you design an LMS that has been carefully crafted to have nothing but the formal social functions in it that relate to courses, and that squeezes out every ounce of possibility that a student might post a picture of themselves wearing a funny hat at the party last night. Congratulations, you've done it. You killed it. It's dead, Jim. That's an LMS that nobody wants to be social in, really. It's an LMS where, to quote Emma Goldman, you know, if you can't dance, I'm not going to your re uh, revolution, and same thing here. So you want to be able to dance in that LMS. You either want to make your LMS or your technology have that capability, or if not, go to where that capability is, to where it resides. So this gets us started. But we can move forward. We can move forward to about 70,000 years. And at about 70,000 years, big volcano Toba blows up. And you know what happens? What happens is that humans pretty much die out. You know, all, you're left with only enough humans that wouldn't even make a really good township. You know, it would be too small a group. And when most of you have died out and most everything around you has also died out, you know how you survive? You get on the move. You get on the move pretty fast, but you know what happens if you're on the move? You need to have technologies that work with you on the move. You need to have technologies that are mobile. What you're seeing here is, for instance, the tip of a fishing spear that can handle fish of all sorts of different kinds that are much tougher than those fish that you used to be able to catch easily because you're moving across domains. You don't know what that fish is going to look like. You need a flexible instrument that can travel with you and can adapt to whatever fish you have you encounter on the move. And you also need technologies that allow you to make the things you need to have to stay on the move. So you need technologies like good sewing needles that can make good shoes because you need good shoes to move. So again, those of us that survive, those of us that are the descendants of those humans that made it on the move, are also fundamentally and essentially mobile. We like to move around. We like for our technologies to move around. And again, we need to think then of our technologies through this lens. Cloud computing viewed as a place to store, place, uh, to store things. Eh, OK, that's all right. Cloud computing viewed as a support to mobility. Ah, very interesting. Much more interesting, much more potential there. And in addition to seeing how our technologies become fundamentally mobile and how they better reflect what we are as humans, what we do as humans, there's one other little detail of that story I didn't tell you. Because it turns out that when you look at the research on Toba, true, human beings had to get on the move. But in addition to that, the human beings that survive, or many of them, were the ones that had already started moving. So one more little addendum here. If you want to really implement mobile technologies, it's not good enough to wait until you have no choice but to do so. To really do it well, you have to do it ahead of when the need is really going to strike. Forward again. Oh, almost the present day now, 40,000 years, and we get to visualization. Why visualization? Well, this is the Venus of Hohefels, and it's a visualization of an idea of beauty. So what we see show up at this period of time is now human beings start producing objects that embody ideas about the world. This is an idea of beauty. They make other objects. 
Some other objects also relate to different ideas of beauty, strength, but some objects relate to ideas such as how to find your way in the world. The predecessors to today's maps were called sometimes wayfinders. So visualization technologies are also fundamental to the way we think, and once again, we can derive knowledge for what we do. I'm going to point out two key things. Number one, this is a three-dimensional object. So if you're thinking about technologies such as 3D printers, 3D printers are technologies for visualization. And if we want to get the maximum mileage out of them, if we want to see how to best use them in education, we want to think about them in this way, as a way of visualizing objects. And the second aspect I want to point out actually relates back to something we heard yesterday in this same time period. And that's the idea that there's an interaction between the arts and the sciences. Because the ideas for visualization that develop in this period aren't just the ideas for visualization of beauty, etc., but they're also the ideas for visualization of space, time, and so on. And when we go to the next period, which is storytelling, starts about 17,000 years, we're going to see all of those things come together. So we're going to see that our use of the technology has to involve a merging of the scientific and the artistic. And I have here storytelling. And in thinking about storytelling, I'm saying, well, what happens? What happens in this period of time is we start finding caves like Lescaux that don't just have paintings. Those existed before. But Lescaux has something special about it. The paintings structure create a narrative, a story. And that story that we see in Lascaux is a story that has a beginning, a dramatic development with a hunt, a hunt that's chronicled by little markers of time, merging once again this art and the science in it. And I'm sorry, spoiler coming up, a sad end. And that's what you see here, the death of our hero. So storytelling is also essential to what we do as humans. And storytelling can also tell you things about technologies in education, how you use them. Does your LMS, does your story, does your website for institution tell a story about how education happens? If it doesn't, you're missing an opportunity. And finally, almost today, gaming. About 8,000 years ago, we start seeing elements like these. These are, well, are basically dice. They're vertebrae, and you toss the vertebrae, and you find out what your score is, and you win or lose. So what we do with gaming is we take the stories of storytelling that embody the images of visualization and make them have consequences. When I play a game with somebody, what I'm doing, how I'm doing it, how I interact, takes some of those abstract ideas, some of those narratives, and makes them have a consequence. You win or lose, but it's a playful consequence. It's a consequence that allows me to explore ideas from storytelling visualization to have them develop in an individual story that I direct, explore those consequences, but at the end of the day, I'm wiser, but not too much harmed. So we want to also bring this aspect of gaming into our educational technologies. All right, so I've given you these five lenses. Do they work when we look at this horizon report? Let me show you. Here's what happens with the social aspect. We see that it comes in in the early years of the Horizon Report, but it disappears. Did the social aspect go away? No. It's just that we've gotten very good at it. It's now permeated our educational technologies. How about mobility? Mobility runs throughout the entire Horizon Report technologies. We see it at the beginning. We see it today. Any technology that we see as important, successful, transformative to what we do in education in some facet, in some aspect, in some period of time relates to one of these mobile technologies. Visualization, again, a fundamental aspect of this. And you can see that if you look at the beginning of the Horizon report, you have it clustered in a cluster of immediate results in the one year to two to three year. And then afterwards, we have a steady flow of visualization technologies running through the technologies that we see in the Horizon Report. Storytelling, a constant thread at the immediate sense. We immediately want to tell stories. And finally, gaming, a little bit less. We're learning to incorporate it, but it's there.
put it all together, and it's all covered. But I think it looks much prettier <laughs> if we look at it like this, a way to think about what we can do. Thank you.